Welcome back, everyone, again to another episode of Scrotus. As I mentioned in our last episode, this is another lovely, lovely dive into the topic of abortion. So uh, preemptive apologies. And uh, my, my dear co-host here, Colin, um, will have some tidbits to say, I'm sure. As, I'm, as restraining, I'm restraining myself. <laughs> I am in restraints. You might not need to be restrained on this one. This one, this this one's a little bit shorter, a little bit more straightforward, I think. Um, and we'll have we'll have some opinions for sure, but uh, less controversial, I think. So shall I shall I dive right in? Dive in. So this case is entitled Moyle versus United States. Sorry, last name or like job profession? Uh, last name. Uh, this is. Mr. Moyle, I forget his first name. I apologize. He is How do you find a Moyle in New York City? Anyhow, sorry. He is the Speaker of the House of uh, il- the Congress in the state of Idaho. And so this is a case involving uh, an abortion law, an anti-abortion law in Idaho. And if it contradicts with a longstanding federal law that's been on the books since 1986. So... I'm going to dive into the specifics of both of these laws and we'll sort of discuss, well, is, are they in conflict? So I will be quoting some parts of the law, so bear with me here, but it's, it's actually not hard. It's not ridiculous verbiage. It's actually quite straightforward, which is nice. So in 2022, Idaho, the Congress of Idaho passed the Defense of Life Act. And this is a law that states that abortion is illegal, just blanket abortion is illegal, except in cases of rape incest, or to save the pregnant mother's life from death, as determined by a good faith judgment from the doctor, right? So a doctor has to say in good faith, I believe if we do not remove the child, um, you, you will die. So that would that would allow the abortion to take place and be legal. On the flip side, in 1986, uh, Cong- the U.S. Congress passed what is called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, shortened to the acronym MTALA. That's what you'll hear it often referred to as. And this bill was, or this law was passed, excuse me, to basically ensure that any federally funded hospitals were doing everything in their power to take care of and uh, support poor patients, right? So just because uh, a patient comes in and can't pay, this is the law that says, well, too bad, you gotta, you gotta help them anyway, right? Uh, you, can't, you can't turn away someone who's like dying just because you think they can't pay. So specifically, IMTALA, this 1986 law, says there are three stages of care. Number one, the patient must be screened to determine if an emergency condition exists. Number two, they must be provided with, quote, stabilizing care within the staff and faculty's availability at the hospital. Or three, if that's not possible, they must be transferred to another facility without deterioration of their condition. Very simple, straightforward, right? The statute goes on to define, okay, well, what's an emergency condition, right? We kind of need to give a definition to this to to make sure that people are, that doctors are, are abiding by this. So the statute defines emergency condition to include when the absence of medical treatment could reasonably be expected that, number one, the health of the individual or with respect to a pregnant woman, the health of the woman or her unborn child is in serious jeopardy. That is a quote from the law, by the way, and I'll repeat that in just a minute. Uh, uh, Emergency condition can also be number two, uh, serious impairment of bodily functions. It's pretty straightforward. Or number three, uh, uh, some cause of serious dysfunction to an organ or body part. Again, pretty straightforward. I'm going to repeat number one just really quickly because that's the one that's going to be the sticking point. So an emergency condition includes a time when, quote, the health of the individual 
or with respect to a pregnant woman, the health of the woman or her unborn child is in serious jeopardy. Okay, so those are the three emergency conditions as laid out by Imtala. So we have these two laws that could be in contradiction to one another. So the US uh, government sued Idaho, claiming that their law, uh, the anti-abortion law, was all about the potential death of the mother and did not include an emergency condition that might harm the mother. So it went as far as death, but not necessarily harm. And so they're saying, due to the supremacy clause in the Constitution, where it says federal law supersedes state law, uh, that state law should be struck down because it is in conflict with uh, the, the federal law. A district court sided with the United States, citing expert testimony from doctors who said that uh, several pregnancy complications could actually result in uh, the, quote, emergency condition as dictated by the law requiring an abortion. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals agreed with that ruling. And so now we find ourselves at the Supreme Court. So the argument here is pretty simple. So Mr. Moyle, the Speaker of the House of uh, the Idaho Congress, he argues that the federal law does not define or set a standard as to how to provide stabilizing care in the case of an emergency. He says the law gives us no guidance and does not spell out what you have to do to pro provide stabilizing care. And to that end, if they do not necessarily say in the law that you have to give an abortion as part of, quote, stabilizing care, then we shouldn't assume that that is part of stabilizing care. He also brings up, quite fairly, I think, in the past, Congress has actually forbade federal funding from paying for abortions unless there was a life-threatening need to in order to save the mother's life, which is exactly what the Idaho law seeks to do. So there's no, you know, from, from our history of, of how Congress works, there's no conflict here. But perhaps I think his biggest argument and his best argument is in that verbiage of the federal law that I repeated twice, right? The federal law says there has to, there, there is a protection of, of death or bodily harm to the unborn child as well. So wouldn't an abortion be in violation of that law as stabilizing care because you're not protecting the unborn child anymore? You're getting rid of it? I think that's a pretty fair argument. Yep. Uh, so the U.S. government argued, uh, uh, obviously, against him, saying that the Imtala law of 1986 requires hospitals to provide treatment that ensures the patient's condition will not deteriorate and that the law's requirement for, quote, stabilizing treatment creates a federal standard beyond just treating patients equally. So they're basically saying we don't have to set a standard, right? We, we don't have to define how you treat the patient in the law, just treat them equitably, whatever that means. The United States further argues that Imtala's requirement of stabilization includes terminating pregnancy, so includes abortion, because in certain cases, giving the abortion is the only treatment that would save a mother's life or pre prevent her from uh, other serious deterioration in health. They then turn Moyle's argument against him, saying that, well, his argument about including abortion directly in the law, if Congress intended for that to be part of it, they would have said it in the law. They kind of turn that against him and say, well, no, when Congress intends to exclude certain treatments, it does so through specific language. And they didn't say we couldn't do an abortion. So I guess it's possible. <laughs> so, you know, that argument is not good for either of them, I don't think. Basically, because Congress didn't explicitly in exclude abortion in the law, that it should be allowed to, to be considered stabilizing care. So I won't 
I won't go, it goes farther. I won't go into the nitty gritty of this argumentation. It's all very similar and revolves around the same arguments. But overall, I think this case is important. Um, it's, it could theoretically set a standard for medical care for women, at least for the near future before we have some kind of sweeping federal law about abortion, whether it's in one side or the other. But also, this could potentially really be important because as part of the opinion that comes out, we could get a justice actually kind of on record defining what is life and when life begins, right? Because if that law, if the Mtala law dictated, we have to watch out for the safety of the unborn child as well, if that's already written to, written into law, then the Supreme Court kind of has to, their job is to interpret the law, right? They have to uphold what's, <clears throat> excuse me, written. So theoretically, this could be a big opinion that sets precedent for, well, what is life and when does life begin? I know that's kind of a stretch there, but it's possible. Yeah, well, you know, we'll see. It's it's such a it's such a landmine, this whole topic. <laughs> um and it is interesting that I, I think this is this I think perhaps maybe theoretically it sort of connects. Um it's been interesting to see how recent statements by a certain political candidate um for gov uh, for president um has uh shown revealed perhaps divisions within the quote unquote right which I'm not even certain is one thing in this country but um mm. um there's there's it's interesting there's a there's the there's the the people who kind of don't care at all yeah which is more than anyone's willing to really reckon with i think how unimportant this topic is for most americans perhaps i'm overly blackpilled on it but i just it's then there's the people for whom it's very important who are willing to say, I will not vote for someone who doesn't take a hard line against this. Right. And then there's those people, and I would who who do take a hard line against it, but understand that there's a larger political game at play and that politics is not about single um, issues. Yeah. And that 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 there's um that you know it isn't a crucial issue. There are other crucial issues and and that you have to kind of try to find a way to stand for this issue while not giving up your country. Um, and that maybe without a country, you couldn't stop this or any other issue. Um, and that, so there's some real, I've, this is just something I've been tracking a bit. Um, it's been interesting to see the conversations. I obviously have my opinion about it, but um, don't necessarily begrudge others' opinions on it, as long as they're not one of those I don't care people. Um, I can see, I can respect, I think, single voter issue stances theoret philosophically, theologically, but politics is uh, a nasty business. And uh, as as a, as at least a part-time Machiavellian, I understand that um, politics is about power and who gets to hold power. And if you don't hold power, nothing will change. Um, and this, so I know that that's a little bit jumping off from this, and a, but yeah um well, i guess in in the to me the main question in, in this case here which really isn't about the abortion per se like that's really not the question here like whether you can or cannot get an abortion the question is the effect on the mother and and how important the mother's life is in conjunction so Yes, there's the there's the side argument that I mentioned at the very end where, you know, that defining life and all of that, that that could be very important. But the central idea here is. Is it more important? So the, the Idaho law is saying the only restriction is if we know the mother's going to die. But if she's going to have like a serious complication that she could still live with, we'll we'll bypass that and you can't get an abortion. Or do we go with this federal law that says, well, no, we have to also consider her future of her life, even if it's not life-threatening, right? That's kind of a really 
hard philosophical question that I'm not willing to to answer oh, or, or talk I'm not, about. I'm not, and I'm not, and I'm not weighing in. I'm not even trying to say that. Yes, I'm not going to downplay that at all. What I'm saying is, there's a many case. So they say on Twitter, many such cases where that is not at play. And people yeah. will make it. Will 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 we'll obfuscate. Will uh, I think I used that word correctly? Will 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 purposely muddy the waters in order to, um, well, as we talked about on the previous episode, assuming they come out in chronological order, hoodwink an entire country about what actually is happening. Um. So, yeah. It's it will always be a hot button issue, but nobody wants to deal with it, right? We have nobody who really wants to deal with the problem, um, and that's I'm going to be really interested. That's a shame. To, I'm going to be really interested to see how the court does deal with it because if they're forced sort of to take a stance on <laughs> what's more important, like the life or the well being of the mother, like I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. Let's put it that way. I I, no. I, don't, I don't want to have to decide something like that. But but I really wonder how many of those instances really happen. Yeah, quite like yeah. they say they do. This seem it mm, because how many? I mean, that's not the vast majority of abortions. Correct. Which is very safe, very safe to say. Correct, and and that's you're getting to another point. We're, and you're creating precedent anyway. that will affect everything. We're arguing about a potentially very small mm -hmm. portion proportion of pregnancies. Yeah. So. Yeah. These these things must be said. But yeah, it's 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 a tough one. But like I said, it's it's a pretty straightforward case. I'm good. I'm still going to be interested because um, I don't know if I object this Idaho law. I, I, I read the statute. I don't see money problems with it. And I'm really wondering why the government really pushed this. But they again, who would have, you know, who would have thought it'd be so dangerous to talk about abortion? It, it's not like there's lives at stake or anything. It's just politics. And, and to that point, I'm, I was actually very surprised because I didn't know this. I knew about that law, the Intala law in 1986 that I talked about. I didn't know that it actually put in a caveat in there because I read I read it verbatim for the unborn child. It says in the law, you have to protect the unborn child. So thus, isn't that saying abortion is kind of illegal anyway? I mean, that was Mr. Moyle's uh, argument in the first place. Yeah. Well, this is the, again, <laughs> hopefully the uh, the subtext was like, I, went, I hit you over the head really hard with it. Boink. <laughs> It's oh. not like it's a life or death issue, guys. Right. Right. Not right. important at all. Not important. Yeah. It's not like it has to do with like lives or anything or like the rest of the, the future generations or anything like that. Yeah. yeah. It's just a, it's just a, it's just a, it's it's an issue. It's just a thing. Well, you know, the courts will deal with it. Don't worry. A clump of cells that the court will deal with. Ugh. I love clumps of cells. In fact, I am one yes and as a clump of cells i i'm gonna say i like clump of clumps of cells i all you know what mitch you life. and all my other favorite people are clumps of cells <laughs> and i and i love you so <laughs> fair point fair point i mean to be fair some days i look more like a clump of cells than others but you know <laughs> i mean in the end uh, well Again, we'll revisit this one as as an opinion comes out, but i'm I'm possibly more interested in reading this opinion than than the previous episode we discussed. So we shall see what we shall see until then. Yeah. Case dismissed.